Good afternoon, everyone. This is Mary Harrell with NAEYC, and welcome to our webinar. With me today is Pamela Ehrenberg, our Director for Accreditation Services, and we're really excited to spend the next hour with you and to talk with you about some of the changes that are um, happening, that have happened and are coming down the pike for NAEYC's higher education. For today's webinar, um, you can type in your questions and your comments in the chat box, and I encourage you to do so. We'll be taking questions as they come uh, throughout today, because what the purpose for today is to make sure that we answer um, any of the changes, or any of the questions that you have in relationship to the um, new revised accreditation handbook and to the revised self-study report templates um, and annual report template as well. Um, so before we get started, I just wanted to just give a few fast facts about where we are in the accreditation system. Right now we have 181 institutions with accredited programs at the associate degree level, um, and that's 212 accredited programs. We are in 35 states, and we have a great peer reviewer pool of 182 peer reviewers. The system is growing. Uh, we have a number of programs that are on the dock for consideration at our next commission meeting this summer, and so we're really excited to have the system continue to grow. So for today's agenda, um, we'll, be, we'll be meeting with you for the next hour, um, and we're going to go through a lot of the changes um, that were, are in the revised handbook and the revised templates. So um, we won't be covering everything, but we did want to highlight some of the more significant and substantive revisions to these documents. So we'll talk through the eligibility requirements, uh, accreditation criteria, um, the learning opportunities and key assessments, collecting and reporting and analyzing the data. We'll look at uh, reporting program outcomes, some of the other policies in the accreditation handbook, and do a quick uh, look at the annual report template as well. So um, we're going to cover a lot. We are recording this webinar, so I encourage you to um, listen to it again. And all, as always, please email us, call us if we can answer any questions that you have. We're here to serve you and want to make sure that you are feeling comfortable uh, uh, with the changes and understand the implications of the changes for your program. But first, before we get started, I, we also wanted to highlight what hasn't changed. Um, and the accreditation process itself has not changed. So here's just a quick overview um, of the accreditation process. And as you'll see, it, it has remained the same. Programs are submitting their self-study reports. There's a site visit. The accreditation period lasts for seven years. Uh, renewal starts in year six of the accreditation process. So the overall process has not changed, and nor have the accreditation decisions. So when your program comes up for review uh, by the commission, the commission is still going to be making the, the same kinds of decisions that it did before. And the standards are the same as well. So um, the NAEYC's professional preparation standards, um, the initial the advanced standards, have remained the same. We'll talk a little bit um, later on about standard seven and the way in which we're looking at standard seven in the system. But the standard itself um, has stayed the same. All right. So now we're going to move on to the actual um, updates um, and kind of move through some of the changes that have happened. As you all know, um, we announced uh, late last year that NAEYC's accreditation system has expanded, and we are now accrediting programs at the baccalaureate and master's degree levels. Um, and we made this change for a few reasons, um, primarily because we wanted to make sure that early childhood degree programs had a home at NAEYC. And um, as you know, the accreditation system previously accredited at the associate degree level. So we wanted to open the program up um, across degree levels. And we have a number of institutions right now that are in a pilot um, at the baccalaureate and master's degree level that are moving through the accreditation system. So um, we'll be looking for decisions on those programs shortly um, and more to come on that. But we have now have had several applications for programs um, at the baccalaureate level who are beginning their self-study um, process with us as well. So we are looking forward to this expansion um, that is also in support of NAEYC's mission to advance the profession and to advance 
program quality and quality assurance across the early childhood preparation field. Great, and I'm going to turn it over to Pam to talk through some of the um, changes in relation to the eligibility requirements and beyond. Hi everybody, so uh, we'll go kind of quickly through some of these next few slides for now uh, while keeping an eye on the chat box, so feel free to slow us down or type your questions in at that point and we can certainly come back and forth to any of these slides um, as, as their, our session gets underway. Um, as far as the eligibility requirements, um, you'll find for the most part that if your program has already applied for eligibility that there is nothing new here that um, for programs at the associate degree level, those have all remained the same. Where we've made some tweaks and updates um, was just to make sure that our eligibility requirements were inclusive of the new degree levels that we're now accrediting. So um, we've added the piece about um, the second one on, under the Higher Education Act designation, which primarily applies at the baccalaureate and graduate level, um, as well as clarifying um, what that faculty eligibility requirement uh, should look like uh, for the baccalaureate and master's degree programs as well. <laughs> I saw we had one question oh. here about um, the renewal process and when should a program begin the renewal self-study process. And so that pro so a program at that stage, would they be submitting their self renewal self-study report in place of their year six annual report? So self-study will begin probably in earnest for programs around year five. Actually, and, and um, thank you. I see another question as well about the eligibility okay. piece. Um, yes, so um, that uh, that piece has remained the same. That um, well, actually, no. You know, I'm, I'm looking at so bullet two. You've specialized. You've um, specified. So um, the bullet number the, up near the top has to do with 18 credit hours of early childhood coursework within the degree program itself. So if it's an associate degree program, that would be 18 credit hours within that particular program itself. Um, the very last bullet point mentions 18 graduate credits. That has to do with the qualifications of the full-time faculty member who is going to be meeting the faculty eligibility requirement. Um, so uh, you're right that the number 18 <laughs> shows up in a couple different places there. The first one has to do with the program itself and the other one is for the faculty eligibility piece. Feel free to type back in if that didn't <laughs> if that didn't capture it. Um, the uh, the next slide on the accreditation criteria um, is also not a lot that has changed dramatically. Um, where you'll see uh, the one new item is the second piece for criterion five. We have a new criterion related to supporting the education career pathway. That was something that we started thinking about a lot as part of this expansion, as we began accrediting baccalaureate and graduate degree programs, um, we really started thinking about the role of programs at different degree levels within preparing early childhood professionals. You've probably all heard a bit about NAYC's broader effort for power to the profession. And so thinking about that whole pathway from the perspective of a, an emerging professional or an established professional, um, what that looks like. And we realized that programs at all degree levels have um, candidates with experiences prior to arrival. So for an associate degree program, that could be um, the candidate's experiences in high school before they began the program, um, all the way up through uh, where that candidate will leave, um, it will continue on to after they leave your program. So encouraging programs to think about both of those. Uh, the other pieces on there, I think we're not going to go into as much depth. It's mostly um, strengthening some of the indicators of strength, uh, building on um, what programs mm -hmm. have, been, have been working toward all along. Mm -hmm. Um, the piece on the learning opportunities um, is really a clarification as well. So um, we've updated the language in the report templates to really highlight the kinds of information that are most helpful to include in that learning opportunities chart. So you'll see there's a lot more examples in there now. Um, we heard you, uh, those of you who have been through uh, accreditation or renewal uh, relatively recently. Um, We've, we've been thrilled to learn from all of your questions and feedback, uh, it's, it's, as well those of you who are serving as peer reviewers and or on the commission, um, to hear really what kinds of information are most helpful here. Because the learning opportunities uh, does come into conversation in thinking about the program capacity. So while programs may be at different places with building and strengthening their assessment systems, 
when the Commission comes to make a decision about whether the standards are substantially met, they do look at the learning opportunities in addition to those key assessments. And it's really helpful when in your, right there in your chart, um, as you break down by each key element, you can go into some, some degree of detail within the required page limits. Um, you're not going to be able to share every learning opportunity, but um, the, the new clarification hopefully gives some, some better guidance than we had been giving before um, on what is most helpful there. Great. Um, so, um, continuing on those lines, I guess, with what the uh, what the commission has has shared with us is um, helpful to be advising all programs. We'll, we're taking this opportunity uh, to include some reminders here. Um, some of you may have heard over the last couple of years more of a focus about clustering. What we've learned is that um, as you're building your key assessments, that if you have one line of a rubric that attempts to address more than one standard. So for example, key element 2A and key element 3A, so that would be addressing pieces of two different standards. That makes it really challenging when you get to this, this stage of data collection and analysis because there's then some degree of uncertainty that you know your candidates did really great on that part of that assessment, but it's suddenly not clear, well, is that showing strength with regard to uh, standard 2 or standard 3? Um, it's, it's less of a problem when there are clustered key elements from the same standard. So if you have 2A and 2B together in the same line of a rubric, at least there's some level of assurance that, that, that those data are going to relate to standard 2. On the other hand, what we're really finding is that where programs are moving is if, if, if this really should all circle back to data that are useful and usable to your program, programs are telling us, and we're hearing you, that really taking that next step of separating out even at the key element level um, really does give programs the best and most useful data. So that's where we are right now, that at least we definitely want to avoid clustering multiple standards um, and programs are moving towards even separating out at the key element level. Um, the second reminder there um, has to do with portfolio assignments. Um, and uh, this is definitely an area where uh, we've, we've heard you and um, in all of your different roles that more guidance is definitely helpful here. Uh, we've been working with the commission to come up with some uh, more formal guidance that uh, hopefully we'll be able to share with, uh, within the next couple of months on um, a bit more details on what the commission is finding in terms of these portfolio assignments. Uh, for right now, we, where we have definitely arrived is that um, if you're going to use a portfolio assignment as one of your key assessments, it should definitely be evaluating something new as opposed to um, having the candidates pull together past assignments and just put them together in a folder, let's say, without, um, without some new component in which they're reflecting on um, all of those different pieces that they've done earlier. Um, uh, and so, and, and so, the, and then the piece that really is the key assessment then is this evaluation of the new, the new reflection piece, um, which does factor into some of the standards rather than rehashing the previous assignments. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so, um, one other change that uh, you may have seen if you've if you've peeked so far in the report templates is that we have shifted from reporting data by key assessment towards a model that you'll be reporting data by standard. Um, and we're, we're excited about this change. And I'm, um, I'm looking around as if I would see nods of recognition from the, the peer reviewers' names that I see on the, on the list here, because I think where this is going to bring the most consistency within our system is that this is really what the peer reviewers have been doing all along. So in the, in the previous self-study report templates, the programs were very focused on going assessment by assessment. And then the peer review teams had to make a leap to analyzing all that information through the lens of looking standard by standard. So um, when they would get to standard one, okay, which key assessments did the program say we should be looking at for standard one, looking at those alignments and those data um, through that angle. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm seeing some nodding heads there virtually. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. Um, <laughs> so um, at this point now, the program really has a chance to do this way earlier in the process. Um, it should make everything a lot more relaxed, we hope, at the time of the peer review visit. Um, it, there won't be surprising questions coming from the peer reviewers when the programs maybe start to think about this for the very first time. Um, so this is a sample data table, what's on, showing on the screen now and what shows up in the self-study report. There's not a required format that it needs to look exactly like this table. Um, so for example, you see that this one has the column headings 
not met, met, and exceeded. That, that is one common model that some programs choose to use in their rubrics. But I just had a call maybe two or three days ago from somebody saying, I heard there was a change to how many rubric, you know, how many columns we had to have in our rubrics. So we want to make sure and clarify publicly there is no rule on how many columns it has to be. Um, there's no set format on how the data table needs to look. Um, we are just, um, you know, providing this as, as one example of how programs could think about reporting data by standard. And so um, where you'll see um, it, in kind of up, up near the top where it says the dates of application and then key assessment X. So the idea here is that you're going to look, um, you're not going to leave the X in there, you're going to look across your overview chart when you get, when you get to that, that year's standard. So if you're doing an annual report, instead of one assessment, you'd be doing one standard. And then in your overview chart is where you'll look to see, well, which of our assessments are touching on this standard. Um, so it may be just one assessment. Um, if you've been coming to some of our past webinars and sessions about alignment, um, then, um, then you'll, you'll be getting the idea that in, in most cases, you'll be thinking maybe about two or three um, assessments it might tend to be a sweet spot for, um, for aligning with the full depth and breadth of the standard. So, um, you know, whichever assignments, assessments you've said um, address some key element of that standard, that's where you'd be reporting those data. And there's a great question um, in the chat box. Um, how can data be exceeded? So that, that is fantastic. Um, what, what was intended here in our sample, and this is always open to refinement and further clarification, um, it, what was intended was for those column headers to re reflect what that program had, um, had put in their rubrics so that um, you're thinking in terms of the N and the percentage of your program's candidates who meet the expectations for, let's say, 5A in this example on a particular key assessment, the N and the percentage who didn't meet it, and then the N and the percentage who scored at an exceeded column in the rubric, if that rubric had an exceeded column. So that, that's intended as an example. Um, we look forward to learning lots from this first cycle of, of annual reports. Um, programs may have seen that um, while we'll be shifting to this new reporting format starting with the fall, um, for programs very first time doing this, we're, we're seeing this as a learning opportunity all around. And so um, we're, we're looking forward to learning with you and very likely making some refinements and clarifications um, for those. So definitely keep those questions coming in every, every format. <laughs> yep. Yeah, no, I think yeah, yeah, just to, re to reiterate that. So as we issue these new templates, I think it's always when the implementation comes to it is as with anything in life, you discover <laughs> what works and what doesn't work with it. So we really are open to your feedback um, as you move through this. Um, and, and just to reiterate what Pam said too, this is simply a sample template. We encourage programs um, to use a format that makes the most sense to how they collect the data um, and perhaps the systems that they use. Um, so please, please feel free to use what's most comfortable to you. And uh, from the accreditation perspective, and I think we'll mention this later on too, we are most interested as you're reporting the data and analyzing it um, and how students have met or not met the standards. So um, again, just to reiterate, you may not necessarily have an exceeded column. Um, and you may have five or six columns in terms of how you're thinking about this, but it, what needs to be most clear to the peer reviewers and to the commission um, is how your, how your students are meeting or not meeting the standards on these assessments. And, it, and it's a good time, too, to circle back to one of our guiding principles um, of the accreditation system that really all of this should feel useful to you in some way. So um, this is another great moment where if you reach a point in gathering your data and formatting things where you feel like any of this feels like jumping through some sort of hoop mm -hmm. to fill out a report, that's a great time to call us. You know, sometimes we'll hear um, programs going through all kinds of stress over page numbers or some other piece of the report that we might have a very simple fix or may have turned out not to be a requirement. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we want to make sure that while we know this is rigorous, that it shouldn't feel burdensome, that the, everything that you're doing, all the hard work and efforts and energy going into this, should feel like it's helping your program and helping you to answer questions that you wanted to know about your program and your candidates. So mm -hmm. thank you for that question and that, that right. answer. And I see, um, Cindy, your comment here too about um, how a lot of regional accreditors um, and other accreditors are, are moving to systems, um, system-wide data collection. And that's a great point you make. I think trying to align um, and leverage that work at the institutional level to support the work that you're doing for NAEYC accreditation. So, um, and again, so if, if your system, um, as you say, Cindy here, perhaps the system your institution's using has four columns in the rubric, um, 
please include that uh, for the NAEYC. We don't want you to have to create whole new rubric, uh, rubric systems um, just to move through this accreditation system. Yeah, something else uh, that I hear about the four column design as well is that some programs find it useful um, in terms of avoiding the tendency to go to the middle ground when scoring a piece of candidate work. Um, so you can decide if that feels useful in your program or not, but that um, if you're really trying to move faculty towards making a determination of candidates having met or not met the standard, that sometimes not having a middle choice, having an even number of columns can be helpful um, in some of those. And Nana, I see that's a great question too. I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. Application of data is a term that we borrowed, I think, probably from the CAPE system at mm -hmm. one point, um, because in an attempt to, to provide more flexibility for programs, but we didn't want to add more confusion for programs, so I'm glad that you, you brought that up. Um, basically, an application of data is each time the assessment is given. So if you give the assessment once a year, then one application would be one year's worth of data. So spring 2015 and then spring 2016 would be the next round or application of data. Um, some programs will give the assessment every semester. So an application of data would, would come once a semester. It would be fall 2016 and then spring of 2017. Um, and sometimes, you know, of course, maybe offered on a more irregular schedule. So we wanted to give that a degree of flexibility, um, but I'm glad that you brought that up because it's not a term that every program necessarily uses. So. <laughs> Chance to feel comfortable there. All right, great. Um, so I think um, for the best piece of this section was um, uh, we promised to come back a little bit to standard seven, which is a piece that is going to feel new to many programs, but hopefully uh, once you delve into it, it's going to turn out not to be as new as <laughs> some programs may be fearing. Um, and we started to get some terrific questions already by email and by phone as well, so we want to encourage. Um, those to continue as you as you think about how this plays out in your program. Um, typically, previously within the accreditation system, um, field experiences were addressed as part of Criterion Five, um, and uh, we had the, the flexibility to do that um, since we are going to come and visit and, and see you on site. What we were really learning is that um, in order to build um, our accreditation system to the um, to the degree level um, as as part of this expansion that um, it really is helpful to look at this as we do in the CAPE system. So those of you who are familiar with the national recognition process, those programs at the baccalaureate and graduate levels have always responded to standard seven as a, as a standard, which is why um, the previous set of confusion, I think, came in looking at the standards publication. We encourage everybody to always look at that full 105 page, whatever it is, um, standards publication. And then we would get calls and say, well, but it mentioned standard seven. I thought we didn't have a standard seven. Some programs would try to add standard seven into the templates and not really be sure how that worked. So we're now getting everybody on the same page that um, the standard seven is a, a standard, but it is a little different from the other standards in that um, the third bullet, what we tried to clarify is that it's still not a student performance-based standard. So um, we're now looking at um, this piece that's in the fourth bullet about the two different, two out of three specified age groups and two out of three specified settings. But we're not evaluating any more than you already currently are within your program, the student performance within those different experiences. So this is more of an input-driven standard in terms of it, it, what your program requires of your students. Um, but it's not, it's not a student performance measure that needs to be addressed in the key assessments. Um, we're, we're peeking on the, on the chat box here to, <laughs> to see on that piece. Um, so um, basically, I'll, um, we'll, we'll circle back to this, to the, um, the, the field experiences in that last bullet, um, what's specified there, um, the, the two out of three age groups have to do with infants and toddlers, preschoolers, and early school grades children. Um, and we're asking or requiring now in Standard 7 that all um, parents in all programs have opportunities to observe and practice in at least two out of those three age groups. And then in at least two out of the three settings, which is um, early school grades, head starts, and child care centers and homes. Um, and again, it's the observe and practice piece. Um, one key thing that is not required is any specific amount of hours. So um, that's a question that's been coming up a lot that, um, you know, do students now need to quit their jobs because they need to do a full practicum in all of these kinds of places? No. You know, that we understand programs have different areas of focus, and so it may be that 
what they're already doing for their practicum is fantastic. Maybe some of your candidates are already doing certain pieces of the observe and certain pieces of the practice, and it's just a matter of formalizing it across all candidates. It may be that because this language is identical to what was previously in Criterion 5 as an indicator of strength, it may be that your program is already doing all of these pieces, mm -hmm. and it's just a matter of writing about it in a different section of the report. So it's, this is a piece that's really just a different way of thinking about this field experience, mm -hmm. but not um, hopefully not adding to any burden mm -hmm. in, in terms of addressing those pieces. Yeah. So I see we have some questions in here um, back on the assessment okay. piece, so maybe we'll go ahead and, and take, uh, okay, well, well we're here, okay, and we have one question and then some questions on the field experience, so we'll, we'll try, we'll, we may get to these a little out of order, but we'll, we'll make sure and get to everybody. Okay, so thanks, Anna. Are the field experiences required in each of the five classes reviewed or cumulative experiences of the five? Of course, it would be. Oh. So this is across the full program. So somewhere within the program, um, it could be in a course that also has a key assessment. It could be in some other course that all of your candidates take. Um, there will be a place to document in the self-study report, um, and then I think to redocument in the mm -hmm. annual reports. Um, where within the cumulative scope of your program are they observe? Are the candidates observing and practicing? Which could be in the same class or different classes um, with each of those age groups and settings. So definitely not required to have five with each of those. Yeah. Okay. All right. all right. We're just scrolling up here on our end. <laughs> um, all right. Can we clarify, thanks, Heather, if standard seven means observe and practice in two of the three early childhood settings with two of the three groups, or does this mean that between observations and practice, students must be able to cover two out of the three settings and age groups? Um, so observation. So, could students, for example, we love examples too, um, <laughs> engage in practice in early childhood school grades only, but conduct observations in early school grades and early care centers? So I think where, where we would like everyone to be would be with some observation and some practice mm -hmm. in at least two out of the three age groups and at least two out of the three settings. And my, my sense is that if they're if they're going to, usually the, the problem probably wouldn't come in quite the direction that it was phrased there. I'm guessing that if, if the candidates are already going into practice, I think it's very likely that as some part of that field mm -hmm. experience, before they jump up in front of the class, possibly they go in for an hour <laughs> or something and do a little bit of observing first. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say very likely if you have that practice experience in place, as you look at the requirements of that practice, I think it's very likely you're going to find there is some observation component to it. Um, I think going from the other direction, it could certainly be possible that there could be an observation experience that culminates there with observation, especially if it's in an early class, early in the program. And so the candidate might not have practice in that particular age group or with that particular setting, but as long as they get two of, you know, mm -hmm. they get something else later in the program, then, then that should be fine mm -hmm. as well. And I think that uh, just to add to that too, we made some revisions to the field experience chart in the self-study report template. And so much like we encouraged um, with the learning opportunities chart, we really would love your feedback on that. We've tried in, that, in the revisions to help um, programs and think about where the, the observations and practice are taking place in the field experiences. But um, you know, as you, as you try out that field experience chart, if there's other ways that we could better support programs and kind of thinking through um, how they're providing these opportunities, field experience opportunities. We are welcome to, the, we are very open to that feedback. Let's see. Great. Okay. All right. And so I think we have a couple questions now on that previous yeah, slide, slide around yeah. um, reporting data by standard. So we'll, we'll start. I'm going to move back to that slide here so we can. <laughs> Thank you. Mary oh, yeah, yeah. the guru. Okay. Thank you for <laughs> getting these technology pieces. And then we, and then we, can, we can circle back if, if there's more back on standard seven as well. Um, so Michelle has a question. For my program, exceeded would mean the students who surpassed the benchmark set by the advisory program and met would be hit the benchmark. Sure. Yes. Okay. And, that, mm -hmm. and that's a helpful way of, of clarifying that conversation yeah. as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, do we only assess one standard per year for the annual reports? Yes. yes, yes, so that is where we have moved. So instead of one assessment per year, um, we're now at one standard per year. So thank you for that chance to clarify that. Okay, okay. and family child care. Um, okay, so now we're back on standard seven. seven. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks for bearing with us as we get used to this new uh, go-to meeting platform. Um, so Melissa's question is, family child care considered a separate setting from a child care setting? Um, and that is actually grouped together. Um, mm -hmm. So the profession has determined the three categories would be family and child care settings mm -hmm. would be one category. Head Start is its own category. And then the early child, or the early school grades, I apologize, early school grades would be the third category there. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Okay, so based on that explanation of our use of standard seven, we will not be using a key assess key element from standard seven on a rubric. Correct. Yep. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you'll see that for your key assessments, you are only going to be uh, using standards one through six for the key assessment section of the report. And then you'll see after that assess that key assessment section, you'll see a standard seven section. And that's where you'll find um, the indicators of strength, as Pam said, you, it should be very familiar for, um, to criterion five uh, in the previous template. So you'll see the same indicators of strength uh, there, and you'll see the revised field experience chart. Okay. And a list of settings. So I think that might have been captured in the previous yes. question, but um, the, the specific language you can find mm -hmm. in the uh, revised handbook and yep. the revised report template. So it, it, it spells it out there, mm -hmm. what, what we said previously, but, um, but feel free to type back if, <laughs> mm -hmm. if we missed some piece of that. Okay, what is the reasoning with requiring Head Start as one of the three settings versus including in the center or home-based programs? And I'm actually That's not sure the history true. of how those were determined. That is a great question. That really is. I'm going to go reread the standards book. Now, I wonder in standard seven and the position statement that there might be a little more background on that. So yeah, I think we, that, will, we will get back to you on that one. Yes, yeah, so we, <laughs> we love the kinds of questions that <laughs> <Yep>. make us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so observation in one setting age group and practice in another setting age group meets the requirement. Okay. So you'll see, so I know this is, we were looking at this last question here. So when we think about um, observing and practicing in an in a age group, so for the infant and toddler age group, you'll want to make sure that there are field experience opportunities that allow candidates to observe and practice in the infant toddlers. And then if the early school grades issue or other focus area, they would need opportunities to observe and practice in the early school grades as well. So it's both observe and practice with each, with two of the age groups. So where we've, where we've tried to give some flexibility and mm -hmm. which could be leading to some of the questions too, is that, um, so I know that, um, you know, not all programs might choose the same age groups mm -hmm. to have, you know, th there could be some flexibility within your program so that if if it works really well in your program to have your students observing, like through a one-way camera or something mm -hmm. like that of infants, but not necessarily have all your candidates interact with infants mm -hmm. in an extended practicum, then you might choose for your practice piece to have the other two age groups um, mm -hmm. being the practice, even if they've done some observing mm -hmm. um, earlier along the way. So we'll continue to refine the language. So we've been getting questions, so we know we need, we'll continue to refine the language around that piece as well. This, okay, so here we have a question. So just to be clear, for standard seven, for students who are earning initial licensure for P12 instruction, they are still required to practice in a non-public school, early school grade setting. Yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so the, the reason for that is, you know, and it ties in with this NAYC power to the profession thinking as well, that as you're preparing this professional who is getting this license to teach pre-K through two, it's impossible to know over the course of, let's say, a 50-year career in the early childhood field, all the different settings and age groups that they're going to end up interacting with at some point in their career. So if they're getting their degree from your program, this is an effort to, to build on what programs are really already doing through <laughs> through addressing this in, in all sorts of different ways, but um, to make sure that this candidate is well prepared for the early childhood profession, which initially for this candidate might involve licensure in pre-K through second grade, but at some other point in their career uh, could take different directions and that you, you feel confident um, sending them forward out mm -hmm. to those different places. And these are, you know, our, the standards, the professional preparation standards are for birth through eight years old. And so I think we've tried to infuse that throughout the accreditation system. And, and to Pam's point is that we want professionals, graduates coming out of these programs to have a strong understanding of that entire continuum, age range continuum. Okay. Oh, Aaron, some history. Thank you. Good. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Aaron says, I'd always heard the history of the settings was based on funding streams, like private settings, centers, homes, federal funding streams, such as Head Start, and then the early um, elementary school grades. So 
that could very well be true. I think that. <laughs> and that is interesting true, because yeah. knowing that context, you know, the standards are up for revision over the next couple of years, and I think it will be worth looking at. Knowing, mm -hmm. um, you know, here in DC that we have some Head Start settings that take place in public schools, and we sometimes mm -hmm. get questions from local programs trying to figure out how that even mm -hmm. works when you have something that's both a public school setting and a Head Start. Mm -hmm. So that that is a helpful context. Thank you. And Michelle, it's a great question. So is early school grades, is that K through two, K through two? And it, um, so when we say early school grades, that covers K through third grade. So that through the eight years old. So. And I think in terms of settings within the CAPE world, we have occasionally even extended the K downward to pre-K. If, if you're talking about a public school mm -hmm. setting, mm -hmm. it could be a pre-K class in the public school setting mm -hmm. that would then be addressing the three to five-year-old age group. Mm -hmm. So as you think of both of those teasing out the mm -hmm. age groups and the settings, it can look different in different local contexts. Okay. Oh, so and not, <laughs> okay, so this next question is pre-K considered early grades or just K-12? Um, so pre-K in terms of age groups, that, I mean that's the three to five-year-olds. Um, but as I think Pam was talking about, in some cases, in terms of a setting, it might be considered a public school setting, or it could be considered um, the um, family child care setting. So uh, depending where, start. yeah, depending yeah. where that four-year-old mm -hmm. goes to school. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So call us. <laughs> you have an opportunity to give us a call <laughs> to talk about your your particular programs. <laughs> yep. Right, and so here's another comment around Head Start cl classrooms that are located at elementary schools, but they're not early grades. So, yeah. yeah. Right, so another question about where do these, where do these fall? Right. Um, and, and I think the key is that they do fall somewhere, somewhere you know, yeah. so that, you know, no one ever needs to feel worried that you've got a, you've got a site that is a wonderful partner and they're your best field experience site and suddenly they're not going to qualify for anything. No, right. it's just a matter of figuring out where and which mm -hmm. boxes. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, can the early grade setting be a before and after school age program that's located in the school? Yeah. And I think we do. I, We've had some examples. We do. We that, do. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think where you want to make sure is that um, these are early grades children so mm -hmm. that um, if the aftercare program includes kindergarten through sixth grade, let's say, how to make sure that the field experience that your candidates are mm -hmm. engaging in is with children in the early childhood mm -hmm. range. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that sounds great. Great. Thank you, Erin. So I see some more history here. And so and back to this question about how the settings, how mm -hmm. we're determined, and so that each funding stream has different program requirements. So that's provided a variety of programs to see. Yep. Let's see. Um, let's see. And that's the before and after care. care. Maybe yeah. an easier avenue yeah. in, mm -hmm. in, for some associate degree programs. So that's, that's mm -hmm. helpful. Right. So here's another question, what if your pre-K is run by Head Start, what would that be considered? Um, and again, I think it goes back to in terms of the age groups, it's, it easily fits into sort of the three to five year olds, and then in terms of the setting, I think it would just depend on how that Head Start is situated, or the pre-K is situated. Yeah, and you'll have a chance, yeah. you know, as you complete the reports, you know, you, you can provide some narrative explanation either within the boxes or underneath the boxes and explain mm -hmm. how you know, you're using this field experience, considering it a Head Start placement, mm -hmm. but it's also this age group or this other field experience. You know, you don't feel like you're ever going to be just checking a box and then, you know, mm -hmm. sending things off into the wind. So we'll, we'll learn together. Right. All right. So here's the last question. Uh, so public pre-K classrooms are in the early school year settings. So, yeah, yes. So they yes. are, yeah. so. Yeah, but a three to five year old, old children. Right. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I think those are the questions so far. We're going to move on to the next slide. So keep the questions coming. These are great and uh, providing a lot of insight to Pam and I too about you know how we can clarify language too moving forward. So, all right. So I just want, I wanted to talk about a new section in the self study report um, and the annual report as well. Um, so this this section um, and it comes after if you're if you're looking at the revised self study report template it comes after the key assessment and standard seven section but this is on reporting program outcomes um, within the um, within the program and so you'll see here and I'll move through the exam the what's included in the report but any EYC our accreditation system is also in its own self study uh, process right now to be recognized by the council 
for higher education accreditation. And this is the accreditor of higher ed accreditors. So um, we are feeling the pain and the fun <laughs> of being in self-study. Um, but as, the, um, as this is a body that recognizes accrediting um, organizations such as all of the regional accreditors and other programmatic accreditors. So whether that's around architecture, speech language pathology, um, public health. So we are now in the process of seeking recognition from uh, CHIA, which is the acronym for this as well. One of the standards that CHIA has is around providing transparency to students in the programs about the programmatic outcomes. And so we, um, as we are finding ways so that we can also meet the standards of, of this organization, as well as try aligning ourselves to other um, regional accreditors and programmatic accreditors in terms of reporting out on program programmatic outcomes. So we are now in the self-study report template. There are three program outcome measures that we'll be asking you to report out on um, in terms of your candidate um, success within the programs. So I'll walk through each of the measures and uh, welcome to take your questions here. And again, this is one of the sections where we've provided some templates of charts of ways that you might want to report this data but we really encourage you to report it in a way that makes sense to your programs. And as I think Cindy said earlier, that you may already have some templates that you use for reporting out with your re regional accreditors or other programmatic accreditors. So um, you know, please use those um, if, if that makes, it, makes more sense for your program. So the for first measure here that we were going to look at is the number of program completers um, in your program. And we look at, um, and we're looking at this for the three most recent academic years. So you will simply be listing the number of, of candidates who have completed the program in a given year, um, and the percentage of those program, those completers who were either full time at the time of the completion or part time at the time of the completion. Um, given the early childhood field and the students that we have, we know that so many of um, our students move through at a part, move through their programs. At, at a part-time status. And we want to make sure that that's reflected in the data and so that it's clear to students who are looking at this and others to get a sense of who, who the candidates are in our programs. All right. So the second measure um, is around the time that it takes the um, students to complete the program. Um, and again, here we have, we have picked some time indicators for you to report on. We're asking um, that every program would report on the number of students who complete the program uh, within 150% of the published time frame for that program. So whatever the time frame is for your program to report out the number of students who um, complete that within 150% of that time. Um, so if you are at the associate degree level and it's a two-year period to complete the program, um, you would report out on the number of students who have completed that program within three years. Likewise, at the baccalaureate programs that will now be moving through the system, if four years is a typical time, they will report out on six-year graduation uh, rate, completion rate for the program. So that's one piece of it. And then we ask you to choose at least one other time, to choose one other time indicator to report on. And so that might be, you might choose to report the number of students who complete your program with 100, within 100% 100 of the time period, um, or those who complete within 300%. Um, of the time frame. So we've provided in the self-study report template itself, we've kind of filled out um, a row of this to provide an example of what that might look like for programs. Um, and again, so this is just, this is to give um, a perspective to um, students and to the public in terms of how long it takes students to complete the program. And you'll see in the template, too, there are places for you to also provide a little bit of narrative as well. So um, we want to make sure that um, programs have an opportunity to talk about the student population and talk about um, you know, the time period. A lot of, we know for programs, a lot of students might take six years or eight years to complete their associate degree program. And we want to make sure that that's um, captured and there's an opportunity to talk through the student population. Great. Okay, so up, oh, Cindy, okay, so another comment. So thank you. So you said programs, you may already find this data already reported in the system-wide data. So um, 
and get to know your assessment coordinator. And that's, that's great. We In the report template, too, we encourage you to make friends with the Institutional <laughs> Research Office, if you mm -hmm. haven't already, or whoever the data guru is on your campus, um, because they, they can be very helpful in pulling, this, in pulling this data for you. All right. So, okay. So I'm just looking at um, other questions here, I think. I think that's the only one. So great. Thank you, Cindy. So that's a great suggestion. All right. So let me move to the next. So in terms of the third uh, program outcome measure, we've provided a lot of flexibility there for programs to report out on. So um, you may want to choose to report out on the um, fall to fall retention rate for the program. Um, if, um, or you might want to, if it's, if your program is able to follow this, follow your graduates, you may want to um, report out on the number of your graduates who are employed in the early childhood profession or pursuing education within a year of graduating from your program. Um, and again, this is while um, CAPE is uh, certainly the uh, accreditor of educator prep programs, um, it's certainly moving in this direction. Um, we also wanted to provide an opportunity of, um, for our programs to report on, on that as well. But that can also be really challenging data to follow too, um, is to follow your graduates. The third bullet here, um, in terms of what you want to report on, you might want to choose to you might want to choose some other measure um, that makes sense to you and that that's important to you. And that might be um, if you're reporting on the average GPA for the graduating class, um, or maybe it's the number of your students who completed their courses with a C or above or a B or above, um, or for programs um, now that we have baccalaureate programs. Um, in the system, programs that use EdTPA or other um, performance assessments, perhaps they might want to report out on their pass rates. So um, we really encourage you to use a third measure that makes sense to your program, that's meaningful to your program in terms of um, program quality um, and program outcomes. So um, I encourage you to take a look at that section of the self-study report. Um, we've provided a little, some, you know, some supports uh, within that template for this, but we are happy to answer any questions that you might have about um, either why these outcome measures were chosen or how you might report these uh, or include these in the self-study report. So I don't see any other questions related to this, so I'm going to move us to the next slide, but as you're thinking about this, just post your question and we will come back to it. Perfect. Okay. So. Um, the good news is um, much of what's on this next slide about commission expectations for self-study reports are things that many of you have been hearing for the last number of years. Um, we, what we have done is really formally instituted these as part of the system as opposed to a side guidance that people may only hear if they went to a webinar or a session or something like that. So it's really just an effort to be more transparent and get the same information to everybody in the same formats at the same time. Um, the first one talks about rubrics rather than scoring guides. Um, the older versions of the templates had, had said um, wherever you had to put a key assessment it would say rubric or scoring guide, um, which quite naturally was interpreted by programs uh, that any form of scoring guide would be equally fine. Um, and what we were finding was that we were really allowing some scoring guide measures to come through the system to have the program um, go through the effort of having a site visit when those scoring guides were unlikely to be able to demonstrate the alignment with the depth and breadth of the standard in the same way that a rubric would. So what we were finding that allowing those previously was really doing a disservice to programs. Um, when we really knew through, through our experience in the first 10 years of the accreditation system that really rubrics um, are more likely to end up with a positive decision at the commission point. Um, and similarly, we've been um, talking a bit more in the last couple of years about objective qualitative distinctions um, between the performance levels on the rubric and in particular between the met and not met levels. Um, so the idea that you don't want that to be a quantitative measure. You don't want to say that if the student gives you three of X, then that's meeting the standard, but only two of X is not, that you, you want to think about the difference in quality um, of those performance levels while also being objective and making sure that your faculty can, can do that consistently. Um, the other piece of that first bullet we talked about earlier about avoiding clustering, um, making sure you've got just one standard, even better if it's just one key element um, within each line of the rubric. Um, and the second bullet there talks about all key elements being identified and labeled. Um, what we had said previously was that you needed to be able to identify where the alignment was, and it was optional for the program whether or not to label it. 
um, what we really found was that if you've gone to all the actual hard substantive work of identifying it, then by putting the label on there, it makes it about a million times easier for the, I'm looking for the nodding heads again from the peer reviewers and commissioners that, you know, if you've already done that work, then that way you can start the conversation with the peer review team on a much higher level because you, they don't need to guess um, what the program was intending. Um, the third bullet point is a difference um, from what we had been saying previously. Um, the, the expectation for renewal programs has stayed exactly the same, that there would be two rounds or um, applications of data, two semesters of data, whatever, two, two times of, um, worth of data from e each of either the current key assessments or um, renewal programs um, are probably familiar that there's an opportunity to include data from older key assessments if your assessments were newly revised um, as part of that system. But the overall expectation for renewal programs has stayed the same. Um, what has changed in that third, bu third bullet is the expectation for first-time programs. Um, it used to be that first-time programs um, would typically come through without any data at all in their self-study reports, or oftentimes anyway would come through that way. And what we found was not so much a great need for data. I mean, I think our feelings about data have not changed, but what we really came to understand was that a lot, there's a lot learned uh, from the first time using the key assessments. So um, just like Mary was saying on our end, there's a lot learned using this new report template for the first time from the program, and there's a lot learned the first time you use a brand new key assessment. And so by requiring data in the report, what that's really requiring is that programs to have used that assessment at least once before submitting it, because there's a lot of things that you're going to discover on your own that you don't need a review team to fly in from across the country and say, oh, you know, this is a little bit confusing in this part here, because you realize that from your candidates the first time you used it. Um, now that said, if a program does go forward without data in their first time self-study report, what that would mean was it would be an accreditation with conditions decision, assuming that everything else is positive and aligned, that as part of that positive decision, it would be accreditation with conditions. So the, the requirement for data is a requirement, but if the program isn't meeting that requirement, that's, that's how that would play out at the decision level. Um, and I'll get to this last bullet real quick, and then we'll scroll up. I see that we have a couple questions. So supportive skills. Um, you may have seen in the new templates, are no longer directly assessed within the accreditation system. Um, what we were finding was that there's a lot of overlap between um, parts of the current version of the standards. The supportive mm -hmm. skills had lingered back from the 2003 version of the standards. Um, when we moved to 2010, we're now seeing that there is a lot of overlap within those, as well as overlap with other parts of things that are happening on your campus, whether it's an associate degree program, baccalaureate or master's degree. Oftentimes, those supportive skills are addressed through coursework beyond what's really the scope of this accreditation system. However, we do hear from programs that these are very helpful. And so we want to remind you that programs can continue to assess, um, going back to Cindy's comment earlier, about integrating with requirements that may be in place for your institution, for your regional accrediting body, for your state, um, other things that are going on, that if you're finding it helpful to assess those supportive skills as part of your key assessments, then absolutely continue doing as, as you've been doing. There's no need to make a change if, if it's working for you. Um, right. And so I think we have right. two questions so far. Okay, okay. okay. so there's We're just, just a reminder. Yeah. <laughs> I'm never sure what other people yeah. can see on our, yeah. our scrolling eyes. So, right. okay. So Amanda has asked, the new annual report on page 10 mm -hmm. requires that we list the website where all of the outcome data is published. What happens if our institution chooses not to publicly publish this data? And I, I think, um, A, that's a great time to call us if there's an institutional policy that is preventing the pu publishing of that data. Um, but for the program outcome data, so Amanda was referencing those, those three measures that programs will be reporting out on. Um, for programs that are moving through uh, first time or renewal accreditation, that might result um, in a condition. Um, and for others um, that are accredited, um, we are we're being flexible as we implement this. So we're making we're including this in the annual report in September, but not making it consequential because we know programs need an opportunity to try out this, you know, and, and work with their institutions to gather this data. But um, starting in March of next year, though, it will become consequential in the sense that it might put um, a program on, on probation um, if it doesn't report this data. Um, however, I think, um, Amanda, I think that was you, I think please be in touch with us, though. If your institution has policies that prevent the publishing of this data, we want to know that, and we will definitely build that into the context for this as well. 
I, just to share with you, for as I mentioned, since we're in self-study with CHIA, the accrediting organizations that are recognized by CHIA, um, all of the programs that are accredited by those are reporting out this data and have to have that data transparent on their website. So um, for the regional accreditors, you probably have somewhere on your websites um, a list you know, of student outcome measures and student outcome data on your institutional website. So um, we are not, um, you know, if that's where all that data is reported, you can just include it there um, or on the early childhood webpage as well. So um, again, we want to be as flexible as possible. We recognize this is a new part of the self-study report and um, for some institutions, it will be easier or harder to report out this data. So please be in touch with us um, if you have concerns with this or if there's particular institutional context, um, such as one that just does, that has a policy against reporting this data. I think I saw another question here. Let's see. Okay, so here's a question going back to the key assessments and the rubrics. Um, so if a program uses quantitative data as well in the rubrics, is that an issue? And I would say that accommodation is yeah. fine, mm -hmm. um, that you just want to make sure that the quantitative measures don't overshadow the qualitative distinctions, um, that sometimes it can be hard to tease them out. Um, you just want to make sure that as the commission, especially, is looking at, you know, at the rubrics, making sure that they can find the qualitative distinctions, mm -hmm. even if there may also be other pieces in the rubrics that are more quantitative. Mm -hmm. So Tiffany, we are looking at your question right now. So is it able to be accredited without conditions if the data from the key assessments wasn't in the self-study but was made available at the site visit? You know, so I guess, well, I think two, two thoughts are coming to mind for me now. So first is the implementation date of the new expectations. So um, this would be for programs that are submitting their self-study report for the first time um, in September 2017 or later. Mm -hmm. So anyone who is currently in self-study or candidacy is still under the existing mm -hmm. previous expectations where data are not required. A program mm -hmm. can get fully accredited without conditions mm -hmm. with no data at that point. Um, for the, once the new expectations kick into place, I think the way that it has typically played out with other sorts of information, because I think I'm going to broaden your question just a little bit because um, programs, all sorts of things happen in between the six months mm -hmm. between when the self-study report is submitted and when the team comes. Um, most typically, um, if there is something that the peer review team saw in the visit that wasn't in the self-study report, the peer review team will write about that in their report. Um, and then most commonly, um, if it was something, if it was something, for example, that existed when the self-study report was submitted, but for some reason the program misunderstood what to put in the report, that kind of information can be included with the program's written response to the peer review report. If it was something that didn't exist at the time of the self-study report, then most commonly that would turn up as a condition, but not as a negative situation. That would be a situation where the commission says, you know, we support, that's wonderful that they saw this. Now with your first annual report, mm -hmm. let us see it as part of mm -hmm. revising that accreditation decision. So accreditation with conditions is still very much a positive decision and the program is publicly listed as accredited. It's just a matter of the commission needing to take a look at one last thing or check off one more box mm -hmm. um, after the first or second annual report. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at Cynthia's question here. Um, will we see this in the future? Funding will be based on transparency of programs and institutions. And I think that's getting back to the published Pro data. Data, yeah. Piece. yeah. So I, yeah. You know, I, I think the um, moment has come uh, mm -hmm. when accreditors, regional uh, institutional programmatic accreditors, they, they are moving to this um, transparency uh, of program outcomes and institutional outcomes. So, um, and I think well, probably all of you are seeing in your states um, the, the increase of performance-based funding for the programs, although I would argue performance-based funding has always been around, <laughs> but um, you know, it's always been tied to <laughs> student numbers, but, um, but you've, we've seen such a huge increase on this in the state. So um, yes, yeah, so I think this is something to come and are all indications from um, the U.S. Department of Education is that you know, this will continue in terms of their priorities and um, for Congress as well. All right, so I'm seeing we're getting close to our hour, um, and I just want to, we'll move through um, just the rest of the slides quickly just to highlight and, um, and just to say, you know, we encourage you in Basecamp, the new templates and the handbook are in Basecamp. We encourage you to look at those. So we'll just do some highlights here. Oh, great. I have a question. Is it possible to download this PowerPoint? So yes, I will um, send out this PowerPoint 
to everyone as well and put it in base camp. So um, stay tuned for that. You'll see that in your inbox. Terrific. And I'll add to that our feelings won't be hurt if anyone needs to duck out right yeah. at three. So we yeah. might run a few minutes over, but uh, we, we more than understand. We appreciate your fitting us in uh, to your busy <laughs> afternoon. So um, this is just a real quick set of highlights of things that mostly we've already covered, I think. Um, some pieces that you'll see in the new annual report mm -hmm. templates um, based on what we've talked about sure. today. Yep. So, yep. so just to reiterate again, um, programs will be reporting out on a standard in their annual reports instead of a key assessment. Um, let's see. <coughs> okay. And we won't go through this list here, but we just did want to highlight in the accreditation handbook places where we've revised or clarified policies. Terrific. And um, so when we realized how long the list was, we separated out a little bit. The, the list at the bottom, um, probably most programs are never going to need throughout the time of your accreditation cycle, but it's in the good to know that it's there category of extensions and consultants and things that most programs don't relate to. The other ones you will want to get familiar with. So at some point, um, you'll want to sit down with a cup of tea and your <laughs> the revised handbook um, and just feel confident about uh, updates to the system going mm -hmm. forward. All right, let me make a turn here. Great. So we also want to remind you, um, we did in the fall put out an announcement that the, f um, the fees would be increasing for the system beginning uh, with the September 2017 cohort of annual reports and self-study report submissions. So I just wanted to highlight this again um, just to make sure this was on your radar screen. So um, you'll see here the um, what's not changing is the site visit fee. That will remain the same. Um, but the accreditation review fee and annual fee, which those are the same numbers, um, those will be changing. They're uh, increasing um, slightly, and this will only be the second increase fee increase in the system over the last almost 11 years now. So um, part of the reason for this is simply around the operations and managing operations, and we are also increasing our supports um, for peer reviewers um, and creating some new resources for programs to support your work in self-study and in terms of maintaining your accreditation as well. So um, please be on the lookout for this as well. This is on our website um, as well. So again, these, these changes won't happen in, until September, for September of this year, so for the fall semester. Um, and just a few general reminders. So um, all of us should be using the 2010 Professional Preparation Standards. Um, and we really encourage you to look at the rubrics at the back of those of the standards book. These are rubrics that lay out um, how the commission thinks about where programs are meeting or not meeting the standards. So we find this can be really helpful um, for programs to have a better understanding of what the commission uh, is examining. And again, just to reiterate, the rubrics and the key assessments um, uh, in your, uh, that you are using should really clearly distinguish between how candidates meet and don't meet the standards. And Pam talked about this a little bit earlier today. Um, and again, in terms of timelines, so for programs that are submitting their annual report in September, you'll be using the 2017 annual report template, the new annual report template. So that's in Basecamp, and we encourage you to take a look at that. Um, programs that are in uh, first-time self-study, they will need to use the revised 20, uh, 2017 self-study report template beginning in March of 2018. You're more than welcome to use it if you're submitting in September, but a lot of you are probably <coughs> far along the way in your self-study. Um, so um, you can, if you are submitting in September, you can use the old template, um, but beginning in 2018, you will need to use uh, the revised template. Um, and again, I think Pam's talked about these reminders related to annual reports and self-study reports. Um, so I'm going to move through those. Um, there are a lot of opportunities to learn more. So Basecamp is there. It has, a lot of, it has all of the new documents um, and some support documents. If you're coming to Professional Learning Institute in San Francisco in June, we'll be doing the full-day workshop, accreditation workshop there. And there will also be multiple sessions throughout the, the institute um, related to the accreditation as well. And we'll be doing those same workshops and sessions at the annual conference in Atlanta uh, in November. So I hope you're able to join us for those. But we also do a number of webinars throughout the year. 
Um, and we really encourage you to just be in touch with us if you have any questions or any concerns. We want to support you um, as all of us adjust to the new templates. Um, and you know, as I said, we are um, also as committed to continuous improvement. So we really do listen um, and we adjust and make changes based on your feedback. So please be in touch with us about what's working or not working um, in these templates so that we can make those necessary adjustments. Um, so we're at the three o'clock hour. Um, I just went before you go. I forgot the last piece on here, <laughs> but you know we always encourage you to become a peer reviewer. This is a great way to, uh, if you're in self study, to uh, look at other programs and see how they're doing, uh, working on the standards and implementing the standards. Um, so I really encourage you to consider that as a professional development opportunity. Um, so we've included the link here for that application as well. So I think we will, we will let you go. We've run over, and thank you for your patience with us. Um, but we really look forward to hearing from you, and thank you for being part of this accreditation system um, as a program, as peer reviewers. I know we have many peer reviewers, and we have commissioners um, on the webinar as well. And we so appreciate all that you do for the system um, and for advancing our preparation profession. So have a great afternoon, and we will be talking to you soon.